Well, welcome in once again, everybody, to another, uh, we know it's going to be an exciting edition of the 19th Hole Podcast for Golfers. I'm your host, Dennis Silvers, and uh, hoping uh, everybody is doing well. We've got a wonderful, wonderful show for you today with somebody uh, very, very special that was very entrenched uh, in the world of golf, uh, both on the women's side and on the man's side. And you'll understand what I'm talking about. Uh, weather here in Las Vegas has been blowing and uh, weather's, the temperature's getting where I like it. It's starting to get hot, you know, uh, mid 80s and whatever. But the wind uh, is just killing everybody. But that's what it is here in the springtime. And uh, it's going to be going away hopefully sooner than later. We're coming to you live, of course, from the great brand new Rigel Studios in the heart of Las Vegas, just moments away from the world famous uh, Las Vegas Strip. And uh, we hope that you uh, have some plans to come visit us here in Las Vegas in the very near future. Uh, everything's open, great shows going on, and of course, wonderful, wonderful golf here uh, as well. Let me tell you a little bit about our special guest before we bring him up on camera. Uh, Charles, Charlie Meacham. He's a man of many, many talents. He's the author of three books. Uh, his third one's coming out very, very soon, which we'll tell you about in detail uh, during the course of the podcast. Charlie also hosts a popular podcast called 15 Minutes with Charlie, talking with golf stars as well as celebrities. And I want to know why the hell he hasn't had me on his podcast yet, but we'll we'll get to that. Uh, Charlie graduated from a school you might have heard of, Yale Law School in 1955, and of course went on to start practicing law. Uh, Charlie was named the commissioner of the LPGA in October of 1990, and I believe he served for five years at the end of 1995. Charlie has acted as a business advisor for the likes of Arnold Palmer and Jack Nicholas, and a personal business advisor for players like Julie Inkster, Annika Sorenstan, and Dottie Pepper. Uh, Charlie has served on the board of many, many companies and corporations and foundations, and of course has received a lot of recognitions and awards all through his career. So it's uh, very exciting for me right now to introduce and bring up our very, very special guest, Mr. Charlie Meacham. And Charlie, listen to that. A lot of applause here in the studio for you, my friend. <laughs> I like it already. I Good. Uh, before we get started, uh, you've been a lawyer for a long time, Charlie. Have you ever heard of any lawyer jokes that you thought were good? You know, unlike what do you call 600 lawyers at the bottom of the ocean? You know, a good start. Why don't <laughs> sharks? Why don't sharks bite lawyers? You know, professional courtesy, yes, all that yes. kind of crap. Heard any good ones that you actually like? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. I uh, I have not practiced law since. Oh, I guess I practiced for nine years after I got out of law school. Yeah. And then into all other activities. So whatever lawyer jokes I've heard, I've long since forgotten. Forgotten. If I think of one that we're talking, I'll share it with you. Okay. Okay. I want to uh, get into right now a little bit, and we'll, we'll expand upon that. Uh, the new book. Uh, that is your third book that you have uh, written. And let me ask you this. What motivated you in the first place, Charlie, to start writing books to become an author? Well, the first book, which was written maybe 10 years ago, uh, is not a memoir, but it is a collection of memories that I have had over the years with friends, um, some quite famous like mm -hmm. Neil Armstrong, some not famous, but all good friends and all people with, with wonderful careers and stories to tell. Right. So that that book uh, was the first book I wrote. And you might get a chuckle out of this. The hardest thing with any book is to get the title. So I got all these things together uh, with me and all these famous people. And I thought, what am I going to call it? I remembered 
a joke that I'd heard where this guy goes to Rome and purely by accident gets his picture taken with the Pope. Well, he's very thrilled about this. So he goes home. He's showing all his buddies his picture with the Pope. Of course, he doesn't tell them that it's an accident. So they pass it around. Everybody, oh, my God, this is wonderful. It's a wonderful Joe. And <laughs> gets the last, the last guy looks at it and says, wow, who's that guy with you, Joe? <laughs> <laughs> I thought that's the perfect title. There you go. There you go. Yeah, yeah. And how did the uh, second one come about, Charlie? Totally, totally different. Uh, one of my sons-in-law said to me one day, uh, Dad, he says, I noticed that you like to use anecdotes in making speeches or writings. And I said, yeah, I, I really do. I think well-chosen anecdote, even even better if it has a little humor in it can be a wonderful way to make a point uh, much better than to try to make it otherwise. So he said, uh, could you put together like a glossary or a dictionary of anecdotes? So if I'm getting putting a presentation together and I want to find something maybe on uh, on uh, uh, ego or something like that, I can right. look in the index and find some anecdote. So I said, well, you know, it's funny because I've got this box next to my desk. I've been dropping things like that in it for 40 years. So I think I could do that. So that ended up uh, the book uh, uh, Total Anecdotal. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it is sort of a fun reference guide if you do make speeches or, or presentation yeah. Yeah. Uh, to find good anecdotes. Oh, totally. It's always, always good to uh, to inject those. I know. I know. Yeah. Let me let me, Charlie, let me ask you this. What has changed the most or uh, the most dramatic change on the LPGA tour since you were commissioner? What do you think that is? I, I have my own thought and answer that I'll give you. See if you agree with me after you give me your answer. What's been the most dramatic change, Charlie, that's taken place? I think the depth of the player's ability. Um, in the old days, even before me, um, th there was a cadre of, of good players and a few great players. Yeah. That, that cadre wasn't all that deep. Now it's enormous. And I think like any other product, ultimately you like a product that has real quality. Right. And I don't mean to suggest that those other players didn't, but there's, a, there's an increasing depth now. There, there must be, oh God, 100 players now um, that really can play quality golf. And I think in, in my mind, that's um, maybe the biggest difference because I used to I used to hear a lot of guys say, oh, God, Charlie, they can't, they really can't play. Well, maybe, maybe that was true of a few, but now the, the, they can all play. Yeah, they can all play. Uh, my, uh, my observation is, and I'm curious to get your answer, and I agree with what you said as far as the yeah. depth. Yeah. There's a lot of gals out there that can really golf their ball, but I think with the uh, insurgence of – Asian players, foreign players, uh, has made a, a really impact on the ladies' game to the point, Charlie, I don't think the Americans are ever going to dominate again. What do you say? I know I, I agree with that. And I'll tell you a, a little story. When Mike Wan was about to take the LPGA commissioner's job, mm -hmm. which he did superb work, um, I said, Mike, uh, this was, oh God, what, 20 years ago. I said, Mike, what are you going to do with the Asian problem? Because in those days, it was a problem. And he said, Charlie, I've studied this. I'm not going to fight it. I'm going to embrace it. Mm -hmm. Because he said, these players, whether they're in Thailand or Taiwan right. or Korea or Japan, they're rock stars in their own communities. And he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work with that. So he did that and built a number of great events in those players' countries. So you're, you're absolutely right. I, I very much agree with what you said. Speaking of that, 
to finish off, and and I, that was well said, Charlie. I believe it was Commissioner Carol Bivens who instituted a policy and and took a little heat for it that the gals that came over that weren't really uh, up to speed with their English, it was mandated that they have to learn English a little bit, enough right. to accept the trophy and enough to, you know, thank you to the sponsor for giving me $150,000. Did you agree with that? I very much agreed with it. And even more important was the ability for those players to interact in pro amps, right? Because if you Good get point. a major sponsor that's that's paying a lot of money and spending a lot of time going around the golf course, and his playing partners can't speak English, right? That's a killer. Yeah. So I think that was a, a major motivation too. Yeah. But that that is virtually not a problem any longer. Right. No, they're all they're all pretty astute, and they they've uh, multilingual, right. and it's it's absolutely yeah. terrific. Let me yeah. ask you the same question uh, that I did about the most dramatic change on the LPGA tour. Let's throw that over to the PGA tour, Charlie. What have you seen that's been dramatic as far as a change in the guys? Money. <laughs> I knew you were going to say I mean, that. I knew the, you were going to say the that. The purses. The purses hurt beyond Unreal. Uh, I don't think the quality of play is that much better than it used to be. In fact, one of the arguments I love to have with my friends, naturally, when you're talking about greatest player of all time, I, I tend towards Nicholas because he's my era. Right. But I, I, I say, think about the competition that Jack played against. Um, five or six hall of famers right now. exactly and so i'm not sure that i could make the same comment about the men's tour as i did about the women's tour in terms of quality of play it it was great then and it's great now um but the money's the biggest <laughs> difference money I is think. is uh, is just incredible uh just as a side note i i think i read or somebody told me that the uh purses for the major championship as you know a la augusta all the yeah. all the purses are being raised do you think uh it's uh, uh, two number one a motivation for guys to play good to make sure they try to get into majors obviously and do you think it has anything to do with greg norman and the saudi league with the money they're throwing out and what do you think about that saudi league charlie well, again, I'm I'm an old timer. I'm out of date, maybe, uh, but I can, I can't find any reason that any player of consequence would want to be playing anywhere other than the PGA Tour, because the players that I know have all said one thing um, in common: I want to play where the greatest players play, right? Because that's where I'll find out how good I am, right? And I think that's maybe ultimately will be the major the major issue. So I'm not for uh, trying to really do any better than what's already being done. I'm a great uh, uh, friend and uh, and admirer of Jay Monahan. I think he's doing a great job, and I, I just wouldn't you know don't don't shake the boat. Yeah, yeah, no, I I I, uh, I agree with you. All right, last question before we take our first uh, commercial break, uh, Charlie. Uh, if you could be commissioner of either tour for one day, what would you change, if anything? I'm not sure I understand what uh, the. What would I change? Yeah. Would you change your rule? Would you uh, say, I, I think you should give more exemptions, you should, what, whatever it might be? If I only had one, I, I would say, go over your rules of play and get rid of some that demonstrably and almost unanimously uh, are, are not right, are not good. And I, that's the first thing I would I would mandate to my staff. I want to I want you to come up with a, a list of those rules that you really think ought to be done away with. Right. And I, I I have a hunch that would happen. Yeah. I and I think that's a 
hell of a good place to uh, to start. Nope. All right, Fine. Charlie, sh- stay with us. We're going to step away. We're going to take a short break. And when we come back, we're going to have a lot more with our very uh, special guest, Mr. Charles Meacham. And we're going to kick this off, with, of course, with JT Fitness and Golf with Janice Thornton. Be back right after this. Want to get stronger, more flexible, fit into your clothes more easily, or even hit your drives 15 yards longer? I've created a series of fast and effective programs that combine mobility, strength, and Pilates that you can do in your home or in a gym a few times a week to achieve your goals. Hi, I'm Janice Thornton, and I'm a certified online personal trainer with JT Fitness and Golf. I can help you get motivated and feel healthier in just a few weeks. Whether it's beating your buddies at golf, getting longer off the tee, or wearing that favorite dress again, I can help you reach your goals. Imagine being able to take a break from your busy day, walk into your workout space, and have an online personal trainer waiting for you. The variety of workouts will motivate you. Your training experience should not be mundane and boring. It should be something you look forward to and results driven. See the results and be the results. Let's connect today. You can email, text, or call, or set up an appointment through my calendar. What are you waiting for? Get JT fit today. Are you an E or a C? Both have Ridgeback. These are loaded with tech. Which one are you gaming? Definitely E for me. It's just so forgiving. I'm definitely an E. C is for Cheka. What else? C is for kill it. C is me. Low spinning bombs. So, are you an E or a C? Hmm, I don't know. Hey, wait a minute. Pound for pound, nothing comes close. All right, we are back, everybody, with more of the uh, 19th Hole Podcast for Golfers. I'm Dennis Silvers, having a great conversation with Charlie Meacham. And I've got to tell you, I have been trying out some of the new Tour Edge stuff, and i got to tell you, seriously, it is fantastic, fantastic stuff. And a big right. thank you every week to uh, Janice Thornton. She's helping my body, at least, you know, getting some more flexibility and all that stuff. But, uh, Charlie, how did you first get involved with uh, Arnie and Jack and how did that relationship grow over the years? And, and you could expound upon that if you'd like. Oh, sure. Totally different. Um, my old company built a golf course in north of Cincinnati, Ohio, when I was CEO of Tap Broadcasting Company. And uh, that was in 1970. Uh-huh. And of course, if you're looking for an architect, it was pretty easy because Nicholas was top of the heap. He was also an Ohio guy and just beginning his uh, design career. Right. So we chose Jack uh, to do that. And so uh, we got to be very good friends then. And that friendship has has lasted now for <laughs> over 50 years. Uh, and we've done a lot of things with Jack and his company over the years. Uh, with Arnie, quite different. I didn't meet Arnie, get to know him really, until I became commissioner of the LPGA in late uh, 90. And uh, uh, he and he and Jack were playing as partners in an event not far from my home here in in La Quinta, California, at uh, at PGA West. Mm-hmm. So when I saw they were playing together, I I went down to wish them both uh, good luck. And Arnie, whom, as I say, I knew not really well then, he said, hey, I've been meaning to give you a call. Uh, let's have a beer after my round. So naturally, I did, met him, and typical Arnie, he uh, bought us each a beer, and then he looked me right in the eye, and he said, I want you to come in and run all my companies. And wow, I wow. I took myself off the floor for several reasons. It was typical Arnie. Uh, he, he was getting very good advice in those days from IMG, Mark McCormick. Uh, But beyond that, I said, I can't really do it, Arnie, because knowing I was going to be retiring from the LPGA, I got a couple of other things going on in Cincinnati, so I couldn't do it full time. 
So he said, well, we got to figure this out. So two or three months later, he called me and he said, I've got an idea. And I drove up to Bay Hill where he was living. Uh, and he, uh, he said, why don't you just become my advisor and consultant? That way you'll have time to do the other things you need to do and still help me. And I said, that sounds exactly right for me. So we shook hands on it. And then he said, now there are two things that go with this. Number one, um, you've got to move to Bay Hill. You and your wife got to move to Bay Hill. I want you here. Nice. And number two, and he pointed to this office right next to him. He said, I want you in that office. Well, the offices were adjoining with a door in between. Mm -hmm. And I don't think from that day on the door was ever, ever closed. <laughs> and uh, so Arnie and I sat about six feet away from one another. It was really funny because he was such a great guy. And he'd, he'd get a piece of mail. He'd sail it through the door to me and say, what do you think of this? So oh, uh, gosh. we had that kind of relationship for for 10 years. So the, the beginnings of the two relationships are quite different but they both became very strong. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that is a great story. And I imagine uh, you played Bay Hill a lot. Uh, a lot. I never, I'm an 80 hand, 18 handicapper, 16 okay. maybe at my best. Okay. So I wasn't, uh, I didn't feel like I needed to play every day. Yeah. But yeah, I played, and there's a short course there, a nine hole course. Yeah. Um, that I played a lot, but yeah, I played Bay Hill. A lot. A course that I probably played more over the years than any is my home course back in Cincinnati, Ohio, the Camargo Club, which is one of the great Seth Rayner gems uh -huh. of the mm -hmm. early 20s. Mm -hmm. no, and then, of course, I belonged at Muirfield Village. Right. Uh, in fact, this is a kind of a fun story you might enjoy. I told Jack I was going to be going to Muirfield just after they opened and Muirfield Village. And he said, oh, be sure and call me. I want to how you feel about it. So I played and, and I called him back the next day and he said, well, what'd you think? I said, Jack, it's unbelievable. It's a great golf course. And then we paused a minute and I said, especially if you could fade a high two iron. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, he, that he is laughed. a good one. That is a good one. You, you know, what are you talking about? I said, you know. I, I've got uh, friends that are very, very good players. They play golf all over the world. They have played some magnificent golf courses and all three of them say, without a doubt, the best golf course. And I don't know when they played it, what time of year, whatever. The best golf course they ever played was Muirfield. Now that's pretty good. That's pretty good compliment, it, it, isn't it? it? Sure is. Wow, wow. Uh, do you think that the traveling now is any uh, any bit of a problem? with the older players, and I say older players, on the LPGA Tour since they are now going out and traveling more and more to play events? Is that is that kind of a, a hardship on them as opposed to the young rookies, Charlie? Yeah, I think it's harder, particularly for those gals who have young children. It's very, very difficult for them to, to travel to, uh, uh, you know, Japan or Korea yeah. or Taiwan. That, that's... That's hard. On the other hand, one of the things I'm proudest of while I was commissioner is we instituted the first uh, profession, first daycare center mm. in professional sports. And uh, the Smucker Company, with whom I've been friends for years, was a sponsor. Uh, Judy Dickinson, who was then president of the LPGA Players, right. uh, was uh, instrumental. She and I worked together. But I think. Uh, the, the daycare center helps a lot, but there's no question that the extensive foreign travel yeah. keeps particularly the players with young children, uh, really makes it tougher. Right. I, I, uh, I, I totally, totally agree with you. And but you can't a, change No, you can't change it. It's there if they want to partake, and if they can't, right. they can't. Uh, right. Let me ask you this. I, somebody, a couple of people texted me a question to ask you. Uh, it's it's been well known or well said for years, Charlie, that Jack and Arnie had a rivalry. Is that true at all? Because they were buddies. They were buddies. I think the the best answer to that is a lot of. By the way, there's a lot in my book about that. Um, I think at the very beginning, 
when Jack came on tour to challenge and challenge the king. Right. Uh, you'd have to say it was a rivalry. Yeah. Uh, but as the years went on, um, I think it ceased to be a rivalry and and developed into a genuine friendship. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, people that you know and respect that can do what you do with with great skill, uh, it isn't going to be long before you're probably going to like those people. Too. Yeah, oh, I agree. And, uh, so it, it was a rivalry, but it, it soon, I think, developed into a genuine friendship. Yeah, I agree. And, and don't you think you need that, Charlie, especially today on the men's tour? Let's take, and I, I've met him. He's a terrific guy. I've met him with his mother. Let's take like Bryson DeChambeau, very controversial. The guy should, you know, sure as hell could play golf. Uh, but he's controversial. A lot of people don't like him and, and other people. But he's good for the game in the sense we need people that are a little bit different, that that you talk about, that people get ruffled over a little bit. Don't you agree? It brings a little bit more to the game. We need as, as Charlie, we as, need personalities. As long as you maintain the respect and reverence for the game, once you don't, then I have problems. And I, in my book is a photograph, there's a story about the duel in the sun, the great match between Nicholas and Watson uh, years ago. Some think is still think it's the greatest match ever played. Mm -hmm. And one of the photographs in that story in the book is them walking down the fairway with their arms around one another. And I just, it just bring, brings tears to you. Uh, to see how those two guys who clearly wanted to beat one another sure put that on the side <laughs> and yeah. care yeah yeah ab absolutely all right uh charlie again we're going to step aside take another short break we'll come back we're going to get a little bit more in depth about your third book coming out and i think it's available very very soon and some other stuff so stay with us we're going to be back with you right after this Experience a salon like no other. Charm Beauty Lounge specializes in hair, skin, and a non-surgical, painless way to fuller hair, designed to boost hair volume up to 400% without glue or solvents. Make your appointment today. Call 702-201-1655. We are back, everybody, with uh, some great uh, discussion with uh, Charlie Meacham, our special guest. Uh, I want to get into the book a little bit, uh, Arnie and Jack. Uh, what motivated you to want to sit down and write a full-blown book about that, number one? And number two, I imagine, Charlie, it wasn't very hard for you to bring up memories and thoughts about these two guys to write a book. You're, you're quite right. What motivated it, kind of interesting, um, the president of the club where I live here in Southern California tradition is an Arnold golf course. Uh, we were having lunch one day and he said, Charlie, I, I think you may be one of the few people, maybe the only one, 
that really knew Arnie and Jack intimately at the same time. And I said, well, that's an interesting observation. Uh, uh, but yeah, I, I think I did know them both very well for a long time together. And uh, he said, I'd like you to make a talk to the membership of the club about some of your memories. Nice. So I did that. And it really, the talk went well. And then I was urged by a lot of people to write a book uh, about the same thing that I had done in, in, in the speech. So that's yeah. how it started. Yeah, that's, uh, that's good. Can you relate to us something that happened with you with either Jack or Arnie or both of them together that you just think is a, a hoot of a story, a hilarious story? This, uh, yeah, two, I'll give you two. One's okay. funny. One, one is maybe not funny, but very instructive. Uh, start with the, the funny one. Um, Nicholas called me one day years ago and said, uh, Hey, I'm in the, I'm in the desert. Uh, let's have dinner tonight. I said, well, I didn't know he was coming. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, where should we have dinner? And I laughed and I said, well, if you can stand bad food, uh, Arnie's got a restaurant here <laughs> called, called Arnold Palmer's. It's a great restaurant, by the way. And he said, let's go there. So I, I saw Arnie. Arnie lived next door to, to us. And so uh, he said, I didn't know he was coming out here. And he said, I'd love to have dinner with him. So the three of us and our wives went to dinner at Arnie's restaurant. And uh, we had a drink and then Arnie typically said, hey, Jack, I want to see, I want you to see this place. So he, <laughs> Jack, start walking through the restaurant. And if you can imagine, diners were dropping their napkins, their plates, their sofa. Oh, I can imagine. Oh, I can imagine. They look up and yeah. see these, these two guys, and they signed a lot of autographs, told a lot of fun stories. So that was maybe the funniest time I've ever seen with the two of them and the crowd around them. Mm -hmm. The not so funny story, but one of my favorites. Um, and I, in the book, I, I call it oops, because I, I don't know why it happened, but it turned out fine. Uh, our wives and, and we were having dinner at Arnold Palmer's restaurant. And uh, we got on the subject of uh, maturity. And when you know, when you grow old and so on. And I said, uh, Arnold, I've always thought that you reach maturity when you come across somebody who is better at doing what you do best. <laughs> and I suddenly thought, oh my God, why did I say that? Put your foot in your Arnie mouth. Yeah. Said, he immediately said, that was Jack. That was Jack. <laughs> so I've always, I've never forgotten that because yeah. he didn't hesitate, try to avoid the question. He just said, Jack was the guy when I saw that I knew did better than yeah. I could do. Yeah. And, th and that's probably also plays a, a role in their friendship. Yeah. Because if he had always, if he'd always been, been jealous of uh, Jack's skills, friendship might not have developed. Yeah, that's true. It, it was the uh, mutual uh, admiration society. Yeah. yeah. You know, exactly. that's, that's, uh, that's very true. Very true. Have you talked to Jack? Uh, and if not, what are your personal feelings, Charlie, about Jack kind of stepping away from the game now? Uh, he's stepping away in the sense he doesn't play as much. Yeah. But he's still very involved with what goes on in the game. Um, and he does, a, he does an email virtually every week um, uh, on, after the tournament has ended. So he's, he's very, very much involved. With Jack, though, my sense is that Arne, Arne played golf because he loved it. Right. He simply loved it. And that's right. why he played every day. Right. Jack played golf, I think, for the competitive juice that it brought. So <clears throat> when, when the competitive juice is no longer there, uh, I think you see a, 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 a different uh, yeah. course of action. And so he just doesn't play as much, but take it from me. He is very deep. I've never talked to him ever 
and ask him a question about what's going on in the tour when he doesn't give me a good answer. Yeah, yeah. And I used to say this about Arnie. I can also say it about Jack. Nothing ever happened in the game of golf without it being run by Arnold Palmer. And I could say the same now for Jack Nichols. The reason is simple. People respect their judgment. And uh-huh. if, you're, if you're really trying to get something done, the last thing you want is Palmer or Nicholas not, not agreeing with what Well, that's doing. true. So. That's that's a that's a very very <laughs> that's a very good point. Uh, where can people? When is the third book coming out, Charlie? Number one, and where can people find it? It, it is out now. Came out a few days ago. Okay. Uh, it is uh, uh, available on Amazon. And it's also available, by the way, the USGA has its own uh, uh, publications arm and they have a store and they uh, they took an interest in the book. And so you can also buy it by pulling up the USGA website and going to their publications. OK, but that's either great. one of those, you'll get it. OK. And are your first two still available also, Charlie? People wanted to get that. I I know that I know that who's that with Charlie is. I'm frankly just not sure about total anecdote. Okay, but give it a try. But because I know be, who's that with Charlie. Is yeah, it'd be a great read and obviously a great addition to uh, yeah. to your golf library. Before we let you go, tell us a little bit about your podcast. My son. Who's and why the hell? Why country. the hell haven't I been invited onto your podcast, Charlie? <laughs> I think you just got invited. <laughs> <laughs> no, but tell us how that came about. How often you do it? Who you talk to? Where well, people can find it? My son encouraged me to do it. Okay. And I, I haven't done one in a while. Oh, that's not true. I just did one recently with Nick Faldo, but I haven't done. I did a a lot early on, and then I got so darn many other things going on. Yeah. That I sort of stopped doing them. But I've got two or three that are just being released. Uh, Nick Fowler's being one. I've done them with David Faraday. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so there, there are a lot of them out there. And uh, Dennis, I would be thrilled and honored if you would uh, join my podcast and I'll make that happen. Oh, I, w- I would be uh, thrilled and honored uh, as as well. As my well. Uh, before I let you go, any plans to do another book? What's in the future for uh, Charlie Meacham and his family? Well, it's a it's an interesting question because I get asked that a lot, and uh, the way I do a book, I actually dictate the book to my assistant back in Cincinnati. She mm-hmm. transcribes my dictation, sends it back to me. I correct it, send it back to her, and then we work our way through. Uh, so when I said to her, I'm getting a lot of people uh, asking me what I'm going to do next. And she said, Mr. Meacham, whatever you want to do, but please don't do another book. (laughs) (laughs) And and I understand that. But what I am being really, a lot of people want me to do a audio version of uh, of of the current of the current book of of, uh, Arnie and and Jack. Right. And I'm because it lends itself maybe uniquely to an audio version, the stories that I would tell. Yeah. So, oh, that's a great uh, idea. That is that is uh, that is a great idea. Well, we wish you luck yeah. with the, with the new book. I know it's going to be fantastic because uh, you're a very good author. The subject matter is uh, absolutely phenomenal, and uh, Thank you. we Thank we you. appreciate your time. Real quickly, Charlie, before I let you go, the best shot you've ever seen Nicholas hit, and the best shot you ever seen Arnie hit. The, to me, the greatest shot I've ever seen Nicholas hit was his one iron on 17 at Pebble Beach. At Pebble. That hit the stick. Uh, I, I, it, if you were, and I was, I was watching from home, it really looked like you were going to get hit right in the face mm-hmm. with, uh, uh, with the ball. It was, and then it dropped down about a foot from the, from the flag. With Arnie, I couldn't pick one because there are just so many. Many. He, he hit. You know, maybe the most spectacular was the time he hit one off the stump of a tree. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure anybody ever did that, but Arnie had so many inventive shots. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he, uh, this is interesting. Maybe your 
your listeners or viewers would get a kick out of this. Um, I said, Arnie, I can't understand how you played so well at the Masters. You won four Masters, and yet your, your ball trajectory is very, very low. And I always thought the secret to uh, Augusta is it's high. It's a high ball, yeah. Yeah, and his answer I've never forgotten. He said, Charlie, you're right. So I learned to hit a high ball for Augusta. <laughs> now, isn't that, doesn't that say it all? It does. If that's what I need to do. I'll do it. It and does. It does. It's uh, yeah, anyway. That's it. <laughs> that's it. Anyway, Charlie, it's been a delight. Thank you so much for your time. It's very, very enjoyable. Make sure uh, Arnie and Jack look get that book. You're going to absolutely love it. And we'd like to have you back sooner than later again, Charlie. It would be my pleasure. Thank you very Thank you. much. Thank you. Okay. Charlie Meacham, everybody. Just a terrific guy. All right. Stay with us. We're going to take another short break. Come back. Wrap up the show. As golfers, we want instant gratification when it comes to a better golf swing and playing better golf. Impossible, you say? Not anymore. Golf Boost Artificial Intelligence AI, has developed and patented the most advanced swing analysis technology in golf. Simply, the algorithms detect your body position and then analyze your golf swing using their artificial intelligence technology. The AI captures all the relevant data from your swing video and then presents you a personalized lesson. Golf Boost AI is the ultimate swing analysis and virtual instruction system for golfers of all ages and abilities. This sophisticated software takes into consideration your height and build, playing level, and returns the ideal solution for your swing. Bottom line, Golf Boost AI is an incredibly convenient and cost-effective tool for golfers to improve their swing. Go to golfboost.com and check it out. The app is free to download and try. Visit golfboost.com today. Innovation begins at a single point. Elements, each with their unique character. Fire Ford Steel creates unprecedented control. Chemistry delivers a touch so soft, combined to create a level of performance previously unimagined. Like magic, the elixir, the new tour ball from Encore. All right, that's going to wrap it up for this edition of the 19th Hole Podcast for Golfers. Hope you enjoyed it. I want to thank Charlie Meacham for a wonderful uh, interview and uh, wish him well. And, and we are going to get him back on the show next week. Next week, look out because my co-host on Senior Delinquents, Jamie McWilliams, is going to be here in Las Vegas. He's going to be in studio with me to do both the 19 hole and uh, also do a live show on senior delinquents. So make sure you uh, tune in for that. So until then, keep it in the short stuff and uh, we'll see you back same place, same time next week. So so long, everybody.